Our second speaker is Professor Francis Fukuyama. Frank is Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University and resident in FSI's Centre for Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. He has written widely on issues in development and, and international politics. His 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man, has appeared in more than 20 foreign editions. His most recent book, The Origins of Political Order, was published in 2011. The companion volume, Political Order and Political Decay, will be published in 2014. Other books include America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power and the Neoconservative Legacy, Our Post-Human Future, Consequences of the Biotechnology Revolution, and Trust, the Social Virtues and the Creation of Prosperity. He received his BA in Classics from Cornell and his PhD from Harvard. He was a member of the Political Science Department at the RAND Corporation and the Policy Planning Staff of the US Department of State. He served as a member of the President's Council on Bioethics from 2000 one to 2004. In fact, the first, uh, the first uh, Big Ideas Forum we held in 2002, Frank spoke at that, and it's good to have him back. He delivered our annual John Bonython lecture also in 2002. Well, thank you very much. I'm really grateful to the Center for Inter Independent Studies for inviting me back to Australia again. Uh, it's very good to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to take a much broader view on the question of the middle class because it's a global phenomenon. But the way that it affects different parts of the globe is quite different, and it has almost a diametrically uh, opposite effect depending on whether you're living in the developing world or the rich world. If you look at the developing world, one of the biggest uh, underlying trends over the last generation has been the rise of a global middle class. Since 1970, world output has about quadrupled, and part of that rising prosperity has meant that many countries around the world now have uh, increasingly large middle classes. The number of democracies around the world has gone from about 40 in 1970 to about 110, 120 electoral democracies in, uh, let's say, 2012. And part of the reason that you're getting more democracy in places like Indonesia, India, Brazil, South Africa, uh, Turkey is because each of these countries has uh, an increasingly strong uh, middle class. And in fact, I think a lot of the instability or the uh, uprisings that we've seen beginning uh, with the Arab Spring in 2011, continuing through the protests in Taksim Square in uh, Istanbul, and then the protests in Brazil uh, earlier this year, are driven really by the same underlying social phenomenon, which is the fact that you now have large numbers of well-educated, uh, meaning a few years at least of university education uh, uh, people uh, who have assets that they don't want the government to bother or take away from them, uh, and who are connected through technology to the rest of the world. And it is precisely that group of people that led the uprisings in Tunisia and uh, Egypt, uh, originally in the Arab Spring uh, and in these other protests. Uh, the, there are various estimates. This is a trend that is going to continue well into the future. Uh, there's a Goldman Sachs uh, study that came out a couple of years ago that said that uh, currently, by their definition, the middle class, which is the middle three uh, quintiles of the uh, global population distribution, is about 31% of global population, but in the year 2050 is going to rise to almost 60%. Uh, if you put this in, in terms of numbers, there's a, another EU study that says currently globally the middle class may stand at about 1.8 billion, uh, but it's going to hit 4.9 billion by 2030. And so you're talking about a phenomenon that we're in the middle of that is going to continue uh, well into the future. And I think Ben uh, Herskovitz is going to uh, talk about uh, whether this is going to have an impact on the prospects for stability and democracy in uh, China. So that's one part of the story, but I think that there's another part of the story uh, that, isn't, um, uh, that isn't so positive, which really has to do uh, with the erosion of the middle class in the, develop, uh, the developed or the rich uh, country world. Now, let me just go back a little bit and, and talk about why it is that having a broad middle class is important for a democracy. If you recall the story that was put forward by Karl Marx about what would happen as countries industrialize, he said the following. Industrialization, 
is led by a class he called the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are people that own property. They own the productive assets uh, in a society. Uh, they set up capitalist industries and the proletariat emerged as their workers. Uh, that class exploited the proletariat. They got richer and richer. The proletariat was progressively immiserated. Uh, the system as a whole would come to a halt because of what Marx called the crisis of overproduction, meaning that modern technology was so productive, it produced so much stuff, but the people who actually made the stuff couldn't afford to buy it, and so demand would collapse, and then there would ultimately be a proletarian revolution as the have-nots uh, redistributed property away from the haves. Now, question is, why didn't this scenario of Marx's ever come to pass? And the reason is really the middle class. That is to say, throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as Europe and the United States were industrializing, it turned out that the real wages of the working class kept rising. And it kept rising to the point where that, middle, that working class no longer actually thought of itself as a disadvantaged, exploited um, a proletariat, but rather entered the middle class where people could afford to own a house, they could go on vacations, they could buy their recreational vehicle, uh, and so forth. And so the classic Detroit auto worker of the 1950s and 1960s at the height of uh, America's manufacturing industrial period uh, represented uh, precisely that kind of broad base uh, of people that uh, supported uh, democracy and a market uh, economy. And I think that around the world it is exactly this kind of person, the, the presence of a large base of this kind of person uh, who uh, supports democracy and makes it stable. Uh, if you want to see what happens when you don't have a middle class, uh, I guess from Australia you don't have quite the same vision of this, but uh, let me tell you that that uh, part of the world is Latin America. Latin America is the part of the world that has the most skewed income distribution in which there are small, very oligarchic elites in most countries and then very large masses, not of middle class people, but of pretty impoverished uh, people. And the kind of politics this leads to is the politics of the late Hugo Chavez. That is to say, uh, this is the region that, you know, actually in a previous generation was constantly producing Marxist uh, uprisings of which there are still uh, a number. Uh, but more recently, it's produced this kind of um, unsustainable populism in which the uh, uh, have-nots vote for leaders that want to tax the haves, and it leads to a very bitter kind of social conflict and, and in the past has led to military coups and the like. So even though Latin America is democratic, it's not a very happy uh, kind of democracy, and I think one of the reasons that you want the middle class to be broad and secure is precisely so as to provide the base of legitimacy for, uh, for a broad, um, uh, a, a group of citizens who, who really have a stake in the society and therefore to support its democratic uh, institutions. So this is where I think we are now running into problems and it's actually quite interesting listening to Bernard Salt because whatever problems he detects in Australia in the last five years. Believe me, in the United States, this has been going on for much more than a generation. And you are an extraordinarily lucky country if this erosion of middle class employment has only taken place uh, since the great financial crisis. Uh, you may have followed the fact that the city of Detroit just went bankrupt, but that is, I think, symbolic of the pervasive deindustrialization that has taken place in the United States uh, over the past, well, really since the 1970s. And uh, in terms of numbers, essentially for uh, male workers in the United States, median incomes have stagnated. Uh, they have gone up only marginally since the 1970s. So that means already a period of some 40 years in which basic uh, 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 incomes of working uh, families have not increased. Now, part of that, uh, has been masked by a number of other kinds of policies and social changes. So now in the United States, most working families have two income earners because of all the women that entered the workforce. But that in itself also has spin on uh, social consequences in terms of uh, decreasing family uh, stability because basically men in a post-industrial 
uh, economy are much less employable than women uh, of comparable uh, skill and education levels. And then the other policy matter that I think Australia would be, it, it would be good to think twice about this, uh, is the subsidization of mortgages precisely because housing in the United States became unaffordable for many uh, uh, middle and working class uh, families. And part of the reason we had a subprime mortgage uh, crisis in 2008 was again because of implicit government subsidies uh, that was driven in the end by this growing inequality. The statistics on inequality in the United States, and, and by the way, I could have shown you some charts uh, that would indicate that growing uh, concentration of wealth at the top of the income distribution uh, it may have been only going on in, in Australia in the last five years, but with a very few exceptions, this is a universal phenomenon across the developed uh, world. So it is also a very big problem in uh, Europe as well. Uh, in the United States, some of the figures are really quite shocking. So that, for example, uh, one uh, well-known study by a couple of Berkeley economists uh, showed that in um, uh, in the year 1970, the, the uh, top 1% of uh, Americans took home about 7 or 8% of national income. On the eve of the financial crisis, that had grown to about 23%. And then if you look at the top 10% of that 1%, that group had actually taken home by the end of that period uh, almost 10% of national income. So the top one hundredth of the income distribution was taking a tenth of total, uh, tenth of total income. So these are, this is a skewing of the income distribution that we've not really seen uh, most of the time. We, we've not seen this really since the um, uh, period just before the Great uh, Depression. Uh, most Americans tell themselves that that's okay as long as there's a lot of um, social mobility, intergenerational social mobility. But it turns out that that's been falling in the United States as well. And so in many American cities, the probability that if you are in the bottom part of the income distribution uh, means that your child uh, and your grandchildren uh, still do not have a very large uh, probability of rising to one of the higher uh, uh, income brackets uh, in the course of 20 or 30 years. Uh, and this, I think, is fundamentally damaging for the you know, the basic sense of optimism and, and the sense of progress that is needed to sustain um, uh, democracy. Why is this happening? I think it's been fairly clear that there are two sources. Uh, one has to do, you know, the, the one that everybody points to is globalization. And that's what links the two parts of the story so that for every manufacturing job that is now outsourced to Foxconn in China uh, or to a, a textile factory in Bangladesh, that means fewer uh, similar kinds of jobs in North Carolina or in California or uh, other parts of the developed world. But the more important source of this is really technological change. Uh, I have a, a, a venture capitalist friend. I, I live in, in Palo Alto, California, so I live right in the heart of, of Silicon Valley. And what this uh, friend of mine says is that every computer genius in Silicon Valley, all of my neighbors, uh, are busy figuring out, they're, they're, they're up 24-7 trying to figure out how to destroy jobs in the rest of the United States. Uh, because it's simply the case that uh, intelligent machines, increasingly intelligent machines, can substitute for uh, many forms of human labor. Uh, and in fact, uh, as the uh, IT revolution matures, the number of jobs that can be substituted by machines uh, increases, and so it's not simply repetitive, low-skill kinds of clerical bookkeeping, uh, things of that sort, but increasingly jobs that require uh, a certain degree of judgment and intelligence and so forth. And so it turns out if you look at the global, or I, I'm sorry, uh, you look at the sources of new employment, it, it's, it's, it's in the United States very much, I mean, I, I guess it, I would say a more exaggerated form of what uh, Bernard was describing in Australia. There's many extremely high paying jobs, you know, particularly in finance. That top 100th are, are people largely in finance. Uh, you get a lot of, um, you know, geneticists and software engineers and, and people of that sort. 
Uh, and then at the bottom end of the job uh, spectrum, uh, home health care workers is one of the largest growing uh, categories, but this is something that pays virtually nothing. And what's being hollowed out are all of the jobs uh, in between. The question then is, what does anyone uh, do about this? And I think this is really the big uh, question that will face all political leaders in democracies uh, if they are interested in the long-term stability of their uh, societies, because a lot of this is being driven by forces that are pretty relentless that you cannot uh, easily control, like the simple uh, march of technology. Uh, there are some public policy uh, responses to this. Uh, the most uh, popular one among economists is simply better education and training, but the fact of the matter is that that isn't actually going to solve the problem for a lot of categories of people. If you're a, you're a a male factory worker in your 19 in, in your 50s and you've just lost your factory job it's really not likely that you're going to be retrained as a graphics designer uh, or as a software engineer or as a geneticist or you know uh, something of that sort uh, and I think that we need to think very carefully about the kind of politics that will emerge if this trend continues because this kind of skewing and lack of skewing of income distribution and lack of opportunity uh, for low skilled workers is, as I said, what's fed uh, populism in regions like Latin America. And I think you can already see this. Uh, in my country, in the United States, you have a Tea Party movement uh, that is very anti elitist and it talks a very populist kind of rhetoric. And you see this in a lot of populist, anti European, anti immigrant parties that have sprung up in virtually uh, every European society. Uh, so this is the challenge, I think, that lies ahead for uh, democracy, and it's one that I do not have a good answer for, uh, but that I think we all need to think about. So thank you very much.